So yeah, I know it's a long reading. But it is one of my favorites. And so, and there's a lot of context here that you have to understand in terms of um, what's happening before and after to really get the flavor of the story. So we're going to dive into that in just a moment. First, let's begin with a word of prayer. God, we thank you for all of your gifts to us. We thank you for the gift of the scriptures. We thank you for the gift of life. We give you thanks for the gift of hearing and speech, for all the gifts of our senses. We pray that as we think together about the scripture and about what it means for us, that you might be at work in our hearts and our minds and our hearing and in our understanding. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Silence is not the natural order of the world. It's just not. Dogs bark, birds sing, humans talk. Silence is not the natural order. In fact, when we experience silence, it can be one of the most frightening things of all. You know how in the movie Aliens, right? In space, no one can hear you scream, right? That idea. Silence can be one of the most frightening things of all. Now, the quietest spaces on earth are built like for research purposes. So I was watching a video yesterday, and it was filmed at the, well, the company that makes these microphones, Sure. They have a space that they call an anechoic chamber. And what it looks like, it looks like a big room with all this padding on the walls, things that stick out from the wall about a foot, just big, thick pieces of foam that look like big spikes. And when people are standing in that room, you can't hear the outside world. And everything you say is captured completely in those walls. There's no reflection off any surface. And if you can picture it, this room is so quiet that it is actually quieter than what humans can hear. So when you try to measure what's the sound level in that room, the scale that we use to measure sound is based on human hearing. So it measures a negative number on this scale. It's that quiet. Now, when you walk into a room like that and you yourself stand still, and quiet, and you're not conducting an experiment, and you're not you know, talking with someone, when you just walk into it, one of the kids said, I can hear the heartbeat in my ears. That's all you can hear. All you can hear is the blood in your own head, and it sounds like a whoosh. It's that quiet. For most people, the experience of silence that profound and deep makes you so uncomfortable that you can't stand it for more than a couple of minutes and that you want out. Silence is uncomfortable because in it, all we hear is ourselves. And so we have a phrase for that. We call it being inside our own heads. And all of us have had that experience where we've seen what it does in the space between people. Maybe when you're in a moment that should be tender and quiet and reflective and just, just a quiet moment between people, but someone is so inside their own head and so oblivious to what's happening around them that they just vomit a bunch of words into that space and totally destroy the moment. Have you experienced that? I think all of us have seen that, felt that. In the spiritual realm, I know that I've walked out of more than one worship service angry because a pastor did exactly that. And in so doing, ruined what should have been a holy moment. Now, I do have sympathy, though I might be angry, because God knows I've done that on any number of occasions, whether in church or in my own personal life. Humans are like this. The noise in our own heads is so loud, and the quiet is so scary, that if there's a silence, we have to fill it up. We have to fill it up with words. 
And that's why we need to learn to cultivate quiet spaces. And we need to practice holding back from speaking all the things that are in our heads so that we can learn to hear that voice that matters the most. So you remember last week we began the series by saying that when we've gone off the map, what we need to get back onto the map is a process of discernment. And discernment, first and foremost, is a process of listening. It's about hearing what God has to say for us. And it's learning to listen with an intention and a trust that God actually does care about the choices we make and that God actually does want to speak into our lives so that we make better choices. And that's true for us personally. That's true for us as a church. But we have to have the tools and the capacity to be able to sit in the quiet, to not fill it up, so that we can hear what it is that God has to say to us. But there's one big challenge, and that's really what I want to focus on today. So the story that we just read, 1 Kings 19, about the fire and earthquake, about this windstorm, it's a classic story. And it comes on the heels of another classic story that kind of puts it in perspective. So you have to look at these two stories together. So if you have never read chapter 18, it's about a test. It's about a test that's happening in Israel. And the question is, whose God is the real God? The king of Israel had married a Phoenician princess. She was a worshiper of a God named Baal. And she had her own prophets of Baal. And Elijah said, let's have a contest. Let's use God really as God. And in so doing, they set up these altars, called fire down from heaven. And whoever's God sent the fire from heaven, that was the real God. Prophets of Baal lost. And the stakes were high because the prophets of Baal paid with their lives for what had happened. And that sets up this story. It sets up the story where Elijah is on the run. He's terrified. He's scared for his life because he knows that Jezebel wants him dead. And so the prophet, in his moment of what should have been his greatest victory, instead finds himself feeling completely hopeless and completely friendless. And his response is to flee to the edge of the map the very edge of the map. There's a saying in the Bible that talks about all Israel from Dan to Beersheba. He fled to Beersheba, the very southernmost part of his country. He's at the edge of the map. And when he gets to Beersheba, he dismisses his assistant and he keeps going. He's off the map. He's now wandering in the wilderness just like Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And his goal is to just lie down under a tree and die in obscurity. He says, it's enough, Lord. I've had it with this. I'm really no better than my ancestors. I'm really no better than those who have come before me. They want me dead just like they wanted them dead. But then something strange happens. As he is worn out and he is depressed and he's exhausted and he's overcome by this kind of self-righteous self-pity, God sends him this angel to provide for him food and water and he rests. And then he wakes up and he's told you should eat a little more. And he eats a little more, and then he rests a little more, and then he gets up. And he's led from there to this mountain that in the text is called Horeb, but in other places in the Bible, God's mountain is called Sinai. He's led to the place where Israel received the Ten Commandments. So Elijah tries to escape by going off the edge of the map, 
but God won't let him go off the edge of the map. God had actually led Elijah step by step to this place that's so crucial to Israel's history, given him, in fact, victory after victory, shown him that people can and will be faithful to God if given the chance, and even provided all the refreshment that he needed along the way. And so, having done all this for Elijah, God kind of pokes at him with a question. He says, why are you here, Elijah? And I hear this as kind of a gentle, kind of reflective question. Elijah, take a moment. How'd you get here? What happened in your life that brought you to this point? Can you tell me? And one would think that at this moment, arriving at this mountain, having been cared for all along the way, that Elijah might offer a word of appreciation might say, God, I realize you've done a lot of good in my life. But no, Elijah's response is more of the same self-righteous, self-pity. And so he tells the story selectively. He says, the people, they've, they've torn down your altars. They've killed your prophets. I'm the only one left. Now, the truth is, there were hundreds of prophets who were actually saved and protected from Jezebel. He's not the only one. He isn't. And he should know it. But his attitude is, I'm the only one out here trying to do the right thing, Lord. I'm the only one. I'm the only one. And now they're trying to do me in. Have you ever felt that? I know that I've felt it. And I think after listening to people's responses to the sermon last week, I think a lot of us are feeling that. I think the church is feeling that. We're tired, we're frustrated, and we feel kind of lonely in this pursuit of God's truth. We look around on a Sunday morning, we see the church is emptier than it once was. We're making the sacrifice to get here. We're making the sacrifice to get our families here. We are trying to live with integrity. We're trying to share the love of God out in the world in the best way that we can. We're doing it in the face of an incredible amount of what feels like just meanness and hate. And we wonder what makes this worth it. And then... I talked to our office manager and she's telling me about fielding calls, about signs that we've got on our lawn that fundamentally say, God loves everybody. Is it worth it? There are plenty of times when it feels a lot easier to walk away and go out and sit under the broom tree and wait for something to happen. Just wait for death to come. Just to give up. There are lots of times when it feels like that. But God is not about to let that happen for Elijah. God's question didn't prompt any reflection on Elijah's part. Couldn't move him at all. He's still inside his own head. All he keeps thinking is, I'm all alone in this. I'm all alone in this. I'm all alone in this. Which is pretty much the enemy's number one line to feed you when you feel despair, I'm all alone in this. I'm all alone in this. And so God then changes tactics, tries a different approach. First, there's the windstorm that's breaking the stones in half. Then there's an earthquake that's shaking the mountain. Then there's a fire that consumes everything. It's like God is saying, you feel like I've forgotten about you, Elijah? How about this? How is this for power? What is it that you have to be afraid of exactly? Tell me. But the irony, according to the scripture, is that even though God sends all these things, God is actually not in these things. Because God is in the thing that comes next. 
a sound, thin and quiet. And it's a sound that Elijah perceives as the very presence of God. And so, in fact, when he steps out of the cave, he covers his face. He's afraid that he's going to come right up against God face to face. And what everything in Israel's tradition says is when you meet God face to face, that you're done. That that's it. No one can see God's face and live. So he covers his face and he walks out of the cave. And we expect that to be the end of Elijah's resistance to God's message, but it's not. Again, God asks, one more time, Elijah, why are you here? And we'd expect Elijah to repent. And we'd expect him to say, I know that you brought me here, Lord. I am sorry. I'm sorry for running. I was scared. I see now you've been with me all this time. You've been with me through the fire. You've been with me through the earthquake. You've been with me through the pandemic. You've been with me through all of it. But he doesn't. Elijah still can't get out of his own head. And so he answers God's question in exactly the same way, with that same self-righteous self-pity that he had before. And that's the point at which God finally says, okay, dummy, here's what I need you to do. You're going to go do this, this, and this. You didn't get it. And what some of the commentators point out is, of the three things that he's asked to do, he does only one. The most important message that Elijah hears there, or that should hear there, is this idea that I have preserved for myself 7,000. There are 7,000 faithful people. You are not alone. See, Elijah's head never got quiet enough for him to actually practice discernment. So God had to hammer it into him. Because that was the only choice. We often talk about getting away from external stimuli as the thing that we need to do in order to listen. We talk about quiet in terms of silencing the extraneous noise, but what the super quiet room proves to us is that the thing that's most difficult to get rid of are all the voices in our own heads. That's the thing that's most difficult to get rid of. And what that tells me is that listening for God, whether as an individual or whether as the church, requires us to check our assumptions about ourselves and about what God is doing. See, Elijah thought he understood the situation. He thought he knew what God was doing here. I'm alone in my faithfulness. The world is against me. It's not going to get any better, and so I might as well give up. That was his thought. To which God replied, Not so fast. Not so fast, Elijah. Do you remember what I did here? Do you remember what I did here? Do you remember what I did here? Do you remember? Isn't that what keeps bringing you back, Elijah? We can't hear God when we're stuck in this kind of cycle of self-righteous, self-pity. And I feel that so deeply within the church today. I feel it deeply within myself today. We have trouble hearing God when we can't get out of our own heads. And when we can't find those places, those silences where God is speaking. Because we spend so much time looking at the tough conditions that we see in the present that we don't spend enough time in the scriptures to understand what it is God has done in the past and what it is that God intends and promises for us in the future. And we're so disconnected from each other, from the community of faith, that we've lost sight of this collective that would help us to know that we're not alone. So we need the silence to recognize the noise in our own heads, We need the scriptures to fill that space with something better. And we need the community to remind us that we're not alone when we want to wander out into the desert and give up. Silence is not the natural order of things. 
But if we want to get out of our own heads long enough to hear the voice of God, we need it. So we can't be afraid of the silence. We need to embrace it. We need to make the choice to listen. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your work in our hearts. We thank you for your work in our lives. And we know that so often we feel like we are out here trying to live this life alone. God, when we feel that way, remind us that it's not, that's not about you, that's about us. That's not about what you're not doing in the world. That's about the ways in which we fail to see what you're doing in the world. Remind us that there is hope for us. Remind us that you continue to walk with us, that you continue to lead us, that you continue to guide us. Lead us into those quiet spaces where we can hear your voice. Lead us into the scriptures where we can understand and embrace anew your promises and lead us into the community in which we can find strength to carry on. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.